Good evening. We're so happy that you're joining us for the last of our four-part series for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Tonight, we have Kelly Henderson, the Executive Director of Forum Families Forward, presenting. But before we get started, I'd like to do a few housekeeping items. So Kelly, if you will go to the next slide for me. You will see on your screen that we have a chat box. You should see the similar um, icons on the right side of your screen, your little dashboard. You will click on chat to uh, share any information, but we would encourage you to make it the most interactive to post questions for Kelly in the questions pod. We will be asking her questions at the end of tonight's webinar. So as we go through the presentation, uh, you can enter your question at any time and I will be going through them and prioritizing them so that we will be ready to share with Kelly when we get to that point. So Kelly, next slide, please. And as you see here, uh, we have a pretest, no pressure. Uh, the test helps us evaluate if our webinars are increasing your knowledge. So we are going to post the link into the chat box so that you can complete it. And I know that in previous webinars, some individuals have not been able to access the pretest, that's okay. As long as we can get as many participants to complete it, that's great. Um, we're trying to troubleshoot what the issue is with the link. I think I've found that it is related to employment um, and firewalls, but um, if you could go ahead and complete it as soon as you see it in the chat box, we will give you a few minutes to do so and then we will finish the housekeeping items. And this will also give us an opportunity to let others join in as we get started. Okay, I'll give you about one more minute and then we will move on. Lisa, I'll just Move Go forward ahead. if you're ready. Absolutely. And as we move forward, I'd just like to remind everyone that tonight's webinar is recorded and will be available on the Forum Families Forward website under our web webinars archive section. And if you need a certificate, you can email our information email address and we will get that to you. That email address will be visible at the end of the presentation or as Kelly goes back, it is also now on the screen at info, info at formfamiliesforward.org. Okay, next slide, please. And just to tell you a little bit about Forum Families Forward, if this is your first time participating in our webinars, we are a family-led resource center in Northern Virginia, supporting foster adoptive and kinship families, raising children, youth, and young adults with special needs, as well as professionals who work with our families. We offer free training, consultations to families, events, resources, and systems navigation, 
also peer support groups, which I will talk about very shortly, and webinars like tonight. We have virtual trainings and offer youth classes and many other resources. For the professionals in tonight's webinar, we are a family partner to the Virginia Tiered Systems of Support. That is a project of the Virginia Department of Education, so you may have heard about forum families through that project. And Kelly Henderson's email address as well as mine is at the bottom of the screen. Please reach out to us at any time to learn more specific details about all of the work that we do. We have a Another webinar series coming up at the end of February and carrying on into March, and it will be focusing on the Accessing Special Education Evaluation and Eligibility Basics. And registration is now open. It's here on the screen, but I am also going to put it in the chat box so that you can access the flyer and learn more at your leisure. And as I mentioned earlier, we provide peer support groups. We have our Stronger Together group. It is in person for youth and young adults ages 14 to 22. They meet twice monthly on Tuesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30, and it is during the school year. So we start around October and run through May. So the participants have the summer off. It is clinician-led and free, and registration can be completed through our website. Uh, the link is on the slides, but I will also put that in the chat so you have it tonight for yourself and you can register if you have any youth, youth that would be interested in joining us. We also have our Foreign Families Together Parent and Caregiver Support Groups. We offer it in two formats, virtually and in person. The virtual group meets on the first Sunday of each month at 7.30, and the in-person meets on the third Wednesday of each month at our Form Family Forward office in Fairfax, and they meet from 7 to 8.30. Both groups are led by trained Form Families Forward staff and a volunteer. They all have personal as well as professional experience in being part of a family that is foster care or was formed through adoption and kinship. And I will place the link for that group in the chat right now. So if anyone is looking for support, we would love to have you join us. And if you happen to miss our previous webinars in this series, they are on our website under the webinar archive section and you see the list that we offered. If any of those are of interest to you, you can go back and uh, listen to the recordings at your leisure, as well as access the handouts that were shared in each webinar. Those two are also available on the website. And the next slide, please. And that brings us to tonight's agenda. We will be covering the challenge when FASD meets school. What do teachers see? Federal state policies for supporting children, youth with disabilities, making it work for your child with FASD and resources for you to share with educators as well as anyone else that you know could benefit for what we are presenting. And I will turn it over to Kelly so she can tell you a little bit more in detail as to what we will be covering. Thanks, Lisa. You did a great job. Um, Thank you. And welcome, everyone. We are so thrilled to have you uh, join us on this very chilly night in Northern Virginia. Um, so hopefully we'll keep you nice and warm and keep that brain um, popping so uh, we, uh, we uh, will um, keep the action going. I'm going to go ahead and ask a little bit about what, um, who, who you are, what roles you bring. So I'm going to launch a poll. So hopefully you're able to see that. If you would quickly, you can check more than one because we know that many of you play more than one role in your life, in the life of the children that you work with or raise. Um, so feel free to, to mark all that apply.
And I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds. All righty, I'm going to close that. I'm going to share that so that everybody can see. And it looks like we have a number of professional partners. Um, we have a number of folks that are not parenting, but we do have a good chunk of folks that are parenting a youth or young adult with FASD. Um, so, and to be honest, I can't see the entire, Lisa, can you see that and read me that 27% response? The 27% response are parenting a youth, young adult with FASD who has an IEP. Awesome, that's very, very helpful to me. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna close that. Um, and uh, we will have another poll momentarily, but I wanted to just share a little bit about who I am. I'm uh, Kelly Henderson. As Lisa said, I am the director of Form Families Forward, a, a privilege to, um, to to do that in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I also, in my day-to-day -day life, parent three boys um, who joined our family through foster care adoption and birth. Um, one of my kiddos uh, is uh, diagnosed with a pre uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, and uh, so I live this challenge on a daily basis. And I, uh, by training, I'm also a special educator. So I see, see um, this issue from a classroom perspective as well as a parenting perspective. So I'm really thrilled to share this information. I'm, I, and if you are coming back from one of our other or more than one of our other webinars, I welcome you back and thank you for participating in our series. Uh, clearly this is an issue that means a lot um, and is very close to the hearts and minds and um, of, of our foster adoptive and kinship families. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about why we're even focusing on schools for a whole webinar. And I think um, we know <laughs> Uh, if we either work in schools or we've connected with schools um, as parents or caregivers, uh, that our schools are institutions uh, and first, and they often have long-standing practices and mindsets about behavior, academic, social, emotional development. Special education is no exception to this, um, and it is a system that's guided by many, many procedures and protocols. Um, and many of those were actually designed way back in the mid 70s, 1970s, when the first federal law came about to serve special education um, needs of, of, uh, of students with disabilities. And at that time, we actually used the term handicaps. And so, you know, the systems were designed in a way that worked back then. Um, and things have evolved. And as we have um, learned more about FASDs and research has borne out more progressive ways to address the sim symptoms of FASD from a more neurobehavioral lens that we heard a lot about that first webinar of our series. Schools have not necessarily kept pace and so there's often a mismatch when we talk about um, families and students um, who have FASDs or are working with FASDs and the expectations of schools and the systems in place to to serve those students. And so we really, um, we, we know we need to secure services. We know we need to um, ensure the appropriate supports are available um, and to expect and sometimes demand um, integration, inclusion, and progress in academic, social, emotional, behavioral domains for our kiddos. So there's sometimes that tight um, or, or challenge that where we rub up against some challenges because our, our needs, the needs of our children don't necessarily fit uh, the needs and the, the way that systems work um, in schools and other systems. I'm going to ask you a little bit about your experiences there uh, in terms of specifically FASD. We have another poll. And I ask you about the cha challenges that you face. There we go. A little bit of a delay. So mark those that, that apply. I believe you are able to mark more than one. All right, I'm going to give about five more seconds on that. 
All righty, I'm going to close that poll and share the results. Okay, we have a strong lead there on one of the, the concerns about um, uh, child's teachers and providers not knowledgeable about FASD. Um, other contenders of, of challenges that you're facing, securing appropriate supports and services, academic problems such as failing classes, and then um, some folks reported having trouble gaining access to services and eligibility. Um, so that's really helpful to know because some of my slides do cover eligibility in some detail, so I will not spend a lot of time on that. If that is a challenge that you're facing, know that at any time you're welcome to call us. We can set up a consultation and work through those issues. So I'm going to breeze through that um, a bit and maybe work a, to spend a little bit more time on how we can work with our staff um, to, to uh, help them understand some of the practices that are going to be effective with our kids. So what are what do teachers see? Oh, I did want to mention, I, and I'm sorry, um, I failed to do this at the, the get-go. Um, there is, in addition to the, the questions pod, where again, we encourage you to put your questions in or comments in, and Lisa's monitoring that for us. There is a handouts pod um, in your little set of menu, your menu bar, um, and that handouts pod includes three things. It includes a copy of these slides, so don't worry about taking notes. You can pull those slides up anytime, uh, download those. Uh, it includes a, a um, an article that uh, I will refer to later, uh, and it, it, it also includes um, uh, a um, uh, a recent blog post, <laughs> I need to think of the word, a recent blog post by Barb Clark from the NACAC Association, the North American Coalition on Adoptable Children, who wrote a very compelling piece about her experience parenting a child and the evolution she's gone through parenting a child with FASD. So those are there for your, for your um, downloading in the handouts pod. Back to our slides. Um, what do teachers see? Uh, perhaps, and you are welcome to uh, raise your hand if you see if you have ever been. Uh, we're not going to call on you right now, but if you have ever seen um, or been uh, told that these are some of the concerns. Whoops, am I not showing my screen? Oh no, yeah. <laughs> I'm not. We see the poll. Oh dear, I am sorry. <laughs> Let me see what I can do about that. There we go. Now we're good? Now we are good, thank you. Awesome, all right, thank you. Um, apologies about that, going on and on. So this, that not that you could see, but this is sometimes what teachers see uh, in the classroom uh, when they're working with our kiddos who have uh, prenatal exposure. Um, so I'll give you just a chance to look through those and you know, feel free to chat anything into the questions pod if those, um, uh, are within your experience because I do think that we hear a lot of these um, these terminologies, some of these labels. Um, I put lying in quotes because we know with our kiddos with FASD that there's a lot of confabulation. There's taking pieces of things that may have happened in in truth, <laughs> um, in reality, or in a story or a movie or, or somebody else's story and taking pieces of that and extrapolating that to their own their own experience. And um, often those kiddos can be pretty convincing in their, in their tellings. Um, and so then the assumption is that that child is purposely lying. Um, and that is not really um, consistent with what we know about um, about FASD, that that confabulation is a real is a real indeed symptom. Um, other things, um, Lisa, are we getting some hands up? I don't see any at this point. I am looking. Oh, we do have one, Cheryl. Right. Yeah. So uh, again, you can always just put your little hand up. You can push the little hand button. Oh, we're getting more. So I do think that some yep. folks um, were uh, seeing some of these characteristics. So that's that's uh, uh, unfortunately some of the the negative labels that go along with with uh, this. So I want to tell a little story to talk a little bit about um, how we uh, position ourselves in this in this world of FASD. Um, and I, again, want to just thank you for taking a step further towards greater understanding and uh, uh, learning more, uh, learning different ways to address FASD-related behavior. So here's my, my uh, cautionary tale uh, for my personal life. Um, I, I mentioned that I'm a parent of three 
active kids and I often am rushing around in the morning and one morning I dropped a bottle of red nail polish to the floor of my bathroom and it crashed, broke open, nail polish all over the tile uh, and the baseboards. So uh, I, despite my immediate and energetic attacking of the problem, wiping and cleaning with all kinds of varied products, um, you can see that I was not successful in removing that red stain from the grout, that that red stain just sort of seeped into the grout and, and remained there. So aesthetically, doesn't look too good, but we have learned to live with that permanent stain. We know, we know that there's not a reasonable uh, solution at hand uh, to restore our previously spotless condition. So like the effect of this nail polish, <laughs> the impact of FASD is very pervasive. And I wanna caution us that while um, we can do our best to learn everything there is to know about FASD, um, to learn from previous webinars, to learn from others, to read and, and take in lots of great information and resources and use that neurobehavioral framework, the impact of FASD is really deep. Um, that stain isn't going away. Uh, so the conditions and the symptoms of FASD don't go away permanently or fully. Uh, it is a long haul with children and youth and young adults who have FASD and there is no easy fix. So while we are offering strategies and programs, uh, I just want to sort of sort of hold in our collective um, arms this the reality that uh, and uh, uh, the reality of that red grout, that that will be there. Um, there. There is no erasing some of the core challenges with FASD. Um, so what is FASD? Again, if you've attended our previous webinars, I don't want to belabor this, or if you are parenting or uh, working with kiddos, you probably know a lot of this. It's a very umbrella term. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is an umbrella term for lots and lots of disorders um, that we, uh, again, covered in previous webinars. Um, there is uh, what we refer to as primary disabilities and then secondary conditions. Often those primary disabilities that are sometimes easier to diagnose um, and maybe the first things diagnosed are intellectual disabilities or what we might say is a low IQ, um, low capability, um, impaired executive functioning, memory processes and, um, and attention limitations, hyperactivity and impulsivity, uh, speech and language difficulties and ADHD. And then there are a group of what we call secondary conditions that sort of go along with that after those, those primary di diagnoses tend to be the, the front line. Uh, that includes the whole host of mental health diagnoses and disorders, difficulty in school, including uh, disciplinary actions that are very frequent. And as that individual gets older, sometimes trouble with the justice system, we know that there is a hugely disproportionate representation of kiddos and young adults with uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in our uh, correction systems. Um, deviant sexual behavior, substance abuse issues, and employment challenges. Um, and just to let you know that all of these slides that have sources on them, those sources are on our website, and I will, sh I will tell you a little bit more about where you can find those later. So as we think about schools, um, what guides the education of children with special needs? Well, there's lots of, as I mentioned, procedures and policies, and our big federal uh, special education law is called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and there are also, um, other uh, federal uh, laws that help protect the rights of individuals with disabilities. Uh, and we'll talk about Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Specifically just with schools, there are also private privacy and confidentiality um, uh, rules and regulations that come from federal law and state law for example, FERPA. And then of course, at the local level, we have lots and lots of school board policies, formal and informal procedures that, that just are part of the day in, day out. We are not gonna talk about those today, uh, but they certainly impact our ability to serve kiddos. Um, I, because of the, the poll results, I, I'm not gonna spend it, like I said, a whole lot of time talking about eligibility. I do wanna make some mention of section 504. That is, um, again, a section of a major fe uh, federal piece of federal legislation, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, that protects the rights of individuals with disabilities and programs that receive federal funding. Um, and that was the, the original intent, was to cover programs that only receive federal funding that's since been expanded with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and that the focus of Section 504 
uh, is to prohibit discrimination of those who um, have disabilities. And that is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And those major life activities are listed out. There's a whole law, lot of them, but the ones that most directly impact school are learning, communicating, concentrating, reading, et cetera. Um, and I mention this because if you have not been able to, um, uh, if you've pursued and not been able to um, reach eligibility determination for your child to, to receive special education under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or what we call, again, special education or related services, 504 is a much broader uh, protection, uh, and it may provide an opportunity uh, for uh, your child to get some some protections as a as they have um, an in, a disability identified under that rehabilitation act, um, and we can again. I'm glad to set up um, time to talk in great detail about individualized situations, uh, but at schools, basically, this is what 504 looks like. A family member or a professional, an educator or teacher would make a referral request, and the local um, school would have a, some type of screening process. And those, those committees may be called different things in different school systems. Um, and then once that uh, child is determined to be eligible, again, under that major life impairment, language, uh, then a knowledgeable committee creates a plan for accommodations. And that word is really important, accommodations. Um, and because that's really what a 504 plan focuses around is accommodating that individual with a disability uh, to prevent discrimination from occurring. Um, I'm going to move on to ADA. I mentioned that 504, the Rehabilitation Act, initially focused on federal funding, programs that receive federal funding in um, well, in 1990, and then again in 2020, in 2008, um, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act uh, extended those protections to pub any any um, any public accommodation, um, and that's where we began to see in 1990 a lot more curb cuts and handicap par parking, um, and a lot more physical access for individuals with disabilities that sort of stemmed a lot from that 1990 law. Related to kiddos with FASD in schools, I really want you all to, to note <laughs> the, um, uh, the special um, addition clarifications that were resulted from amendments to the ADA in 2008, where it broadened the class of persons who with disabilities who were eligible and protected by the statutes of ADA and 504. And this second bullet is particularly key for our kiddos with FASD who might be a little bit higher functioning um, academically. Academic success does not necessarily disqualify a student from being identified with a disability. So the argument that, well, he's getting Bs or he's getting Cs and he's doing okay in school, that must mean that he has no disability and everything's fine and we don't need to, to create a Section 504 plan, we don't need to accommodate, is just patently false. So it's really important to understand, especially if you are um, have tried to uh, um, go through the eligibility process for special education and not been successful, this may be an avenue that we can talk about. Uh, there is a link there uh, with even more information about those amendments to ADA if you're interested. Um, Lisa, I'm just going to pause because I'm going like a steam steam roller here. Anything that I need to address right now before we move on to IDA? Um, someone just mentioned that um, to clarify, low IQ is not found for all students diagnosed with FASD and that some can have an average or high IQ along with the diagnosis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and the point of that slide was just to identify some of the, the uh, disabilities under which that a child may be with FASD may be identified in other in the in the health realm. Um, so yes, absolutely. And that's where actually 504 and ADA may be even more relevant for those kiddos who are who do not have that um, academic uh, cognitive limitation. Anything else, Lisa? Um, someone just asked, is this the same as reasonable accommodations in the interest of education, educating the kiddo? Yes. Yep. Yep. Reasonable accommodations. Yep. Absolutely. 
So I, again, because of the poll results, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time because it looks like those of you who are raising kids with FASD have, uh, many of you, most of you have been able to, uh, to uh, acquire supports and services and specialized education for them through the special education process. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Again, we can, you have the slides, and if you want to get into more specifics, we can do that. Um, but what is special education? It really is guided, again, by that Individuals with Disabilities Education Act at a federal level, and then there are state regulations that implement that. It is specially designed instruction, and that first bullet is hugely important for distinguishing special education from 504 accommodations or reasonable accommodations. Uh, and, uh, and that's really where a, a child needs something different. Um, they don't need, need extended time. They don't need a um, uh, 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 hall pass to take a break when they're frustrated. They need something that's unique to them, specially designed instruction. Uh, special education is is at no cost in the public schools to the child with a disability or their family, and it is designed again to meet the unique or individualized needs of the child. I want to make mention of uh, one of the tools that Form Families Forward has to offer, and that's our Learning Your Way uh, special um, new uh, online course offering that we have, and that opens in February. <laughs> soon. Uh, registration opens for our next window of Learning Your Way, and there is a course in that online uh, self-paced uh, learning module called Special Education One-on-One. -on -One. So if, if this is something that you want to learn more about, uh, we invite you to Register for that, it's completely free. You have a window of uh, four months, I think, to, to review the courses that, um, you know, take maybe an hour at, at uh, a little bit more about special education. Um, so and again, I mentioned the legal foundations of special education, the federal law, and then state regulations. Um, Kelly, I've put the link to Learning Your Way in the chat. Thank you, Lisa. Um, a couple really foundational concepts in IDA are important to understand. Again, it's free. It is an appropriate um, education for all children with disabilities. Um, we sometimes call that FAPE, and you'll hear that in the special education world when they're talking about the quality and delivery of services. Uh, there's also a, a presumption of education in the least restrictive environment. In other words, with children who do not have disabilities to the greatest extent appropriate for that individual. There is a lot of protections for the right of their of the children and their parents. You'll notice that I put parent in green because for our foster, adoptive, and kinship families, it's really important to know that that parent term is the term used in the law and the regulations, but it does include, may include foster parents. In many cases, it does. It includes grandparents, other extended relatives who may be um, uh, serving a custodial role in that child's life, uh, and it certainly in includes adoptive parents. There is a cycle as we think about special education. Um, we start there in that sort of upper left with referral uh, that moves to evaluation eligibility, then an IEP or individualized education program is created and crafted. Uh, that's followed by implementation of the IEP through instruction and monitoring, and then annual review at least at least annually, and then uh, to the extent appropriate, we can um, continue on that cycle and uh, reassess periodically to make sure that that child is indeed still a child with a disability who requires specialized instruction. Um, I'm not gonna go into this a lot because again, if, if it sounds like a lot of you have been through this process, you understand um, sort of how to get into the door, through the door. Um, I, um, uh, again, encourage you to look at those slides if you need assistance in that area. Um, just a reminder that once that referral is made and a decision is made that indeed there's reason to believe that this child may have a disability, then that evaluation phase is really key for families to share, particularly our foster adoptive and kinship families, to share information that may be helpful to that team about the child's history, what is known, particularly about uh, prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and if you have outside sources of evaluation that maybe came 
to you uh, if that child was not in your care initially and there's additional information that could be shared at this point in the valuation. Um, I'm not going to get into independent of educational valuation, but it is a provision under the law that if you disagree with the school's findings in an evaluation, you have the right to have an outside provider conduct that evaluation. And that sometimes is particularly helpful for our kiddos who have um, prenatal alcohol exposure and the schools may not be as familiar with evaluating their needs. Um, after a referral and evaluation eligibility, and I am just going to pause a bit here on this slide because um, this is sometimes where we um, hear a lot of concerns from families. I know that my child has a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. You know, we have documentation of that. Why can't I just get that identified through the schools and get services? Um, and that's because special education is a label driven system and there are eligibility categories. And these are those, uh, those categories. And so, um, any individual child with a disability has to be identified at, under at least one of these categories to receive special education um, and related services. I know that isn't always uh, pleasant to hear <laughs> and it doesn't always make sense, but it is the reality of our system. Remember that slide? about how the, the puzzle pieces don't always fit. Um, this is one example. Um, so the green categories I've highlighted there are common. They are not the only ones. And it, again, depending on the individual's um, characteristics, some of them will not fit as our, as our commenter posted about intellectual disability. Not all kiddos with uh, FASD, and in fact, a lot of them do not identify uh, or would be eligible for an intellectual disability. But there may be other categories under which an FASD, a child with FASD uh, could be identified. So uh, I'll just uh, point out um, for our families of younger kids that developmental delay um, is one of those categories that can be used in the state of Virginia through the year that the child turns six. After that, that has to um, be, uh, considered that child has to be considered to be eligible under another category. So that is a challenge in the state of Virginia. If you have a little kiddo, you know that they have um, a prenatal alcohol exposure or maybe getting early intervention or preschool services. Um, and then at some point under the developmental delay category, and then at some point another category will have to be identified. Um, all right, let's talk about that intervening phase that what do we do um, when we think about um, uh, intervening for kiddos with FASD. Um, and I thought this quote was um, was particularly helpful as we thought about um, uh, the the spectrum, that umbrella that FA that kiddos with FASD um, uh, have. Um, so this is a quote from an article, and again, I'll tell you at the end how we can access all of these articles. In light of the multiple risks often experienced by children with FASD, designing effective interventions may be challenging. Interventions that seek to both remediate those primary deficits as well as mitigate the various environmental liabilities that often accompany a history of prenatal alcohol exposure may yield the most positive outcomes. So it's a very wordy sentence. That means we have to really think about interventions that are going to address those primary disabilities, as well as making accommodations to the environment that the child is being served in. Um, and that's sometimes where we, again, can hit a little bit of a rub with our school system, um, because thinking about that environment may not be their first their first um, instinct. Uh, and all of that is considered and, and um, hopefully incorporated into that individualized education program, which is key for our kiddos with disabilities. Um, again, because of our poll results, I know that a lot of you are already familiar with IEPs. I'm not going to get into all that as IEPs. There's a lot that goes into an IEP, a lot of people around the table when we're, we're creating IEPs, lots of components of the IEP, uh, lots of procedural safeguards. Uh, and again, we're, we're here to help you with any of that if, if need be. The other um, piece of the IEP, one of the other pieces of the IEP is a statement of the related services. Um, so we know that there's specialized instruction, uh, but there's also a statement of those developmental corrective or supportive services that can help the child to benefit from special education. Um, and that is quite a list. Some of us and um, uh, are with our school experience are not necessarily aware of that full list. And so it is really important for you to ask those questions if you're a parent, caregiver, or a helping professional to ask about some of these. If you you feel that that could be beneficial to um, your individual child. 
Uh, so uh, just don't hesitate to ask, <laughs> because again, this is a, a full menu of options that could be beneficial to your child to, to allow them to receive the benefit of special education. Um, so I want to go to another quote, and this is another article we'll talk about uh, at the end. Um, in order for our students with FASDs to be successful, teachers must understand the neurocognitive impact of prenatal exposure to alcohol, modify the environment to support appropriate behavior, and then explicitly teach metacognitive strategies. So I thought this was a nice sort of summary as we think about that whole special education cycle, understanding the nature of the impact, and hopefully that is facilitated by a good, accurate um, evaluation, uh, as well as any input from the family and outside providers, modifying the environment to support a appropriate behavior, and then explicitly teaching. And that's where that special education instructional piece comes in. Um, and we know, research is pretty clear, that when we explicitly teach metacognitive strategies, and that's a fancy way of, think, of talking about when kids learn and think about their own thinking. So strategies like self-regulation, uh, stop and think, um, those kinds of things that help them think about their own thinking in a way that's going to help them be more successful are those metacognitive strategies. When those are taught directly to children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, we see good good outcomes. And again, you can go back to the webinar recording from last week to hear more about that from Dr. Malayans at Emory University. Many of the interventions she talked about were in fact metacognitive in nature. Uh, from that same article, some modifications. And this is where, since we had a lot of folks uh, indicate in the poll that they were struggling to have the, the service providers in their children's lives um, or, the, or perhaps the, the children they work with um, necessarily be able to understand how to help these kiddos, here's uh, what I hope is a ho helpful chart. Um, over on the left-hand side are a number of the challenges that are pretty common with our kiddos with FASD. And then on the right-hand side are some potential environmental modifications. Again, these are things that we are doing around the child in, uh, for the environment in which the child is going to be interacting. We are not doing these and expecting a child to do things for us. Um, so I think that's really important. These are modifications we're making in the environment. We're not expecting the child to change. Um, uh, everything about their behavior to satisfy our, our needs. So I think it's really important to take a look at that. That article will be available for you to share with your, um, your teachers and providers and colleagues. It's just a whole list of uh, accommodations and modifications, regardless if your child is receiving some supports and protections under 504 or uh, has an IEP. Uh, some of these accommodations may be appropriate and should be listed in their plan, whether it's a 504 plan or an IEP. Um, these are just examples of really some that may help us think outside the box to help that child become a little bit more successful through environmental modifications. And again, I invite you to, be, to look back at that list on your handouts. Um, just a nod to the fact that if your child um, is um, receiving special education services, there are a whole set of procedural safeguards. It is really important for family members to understand those procedural safeguards. You will be handed a notice of those at many times throughout the process. Um, and it's not exciting reading, but it is really, really important, especially if you feel that your child is not getting the, the services and supports that he or she needs. I uh, want to talk a little bit about, about our little kiddos. Um, if you adopted or are in the care of a foster child or um, are an extended relative caring for a young child, I know that there are some options for uh, serving those little kids before they hit school um, or in those early years. Um, uh, and again, we can help navigate a lot of this at Form Families Forward, but I just wanted to make it really clear that even the babies and toddlers, if we know that fetal alcohol prenatal exposure is an issue, there are lots of uh, ways to begin to get those services early, uh, and that is critical to their ability to develop, um, develop appropriately. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about opportunities for our school-age kiddos. Um, 
when a child has a 504 plan or IEP, here are some leverage points uh, to really think about as we think about helping those kiddos be successful. That present level of performance, in Virginia we call that PLOP, um, <laughs> uh, and it's just a statement that has to be in every IEP that talks about where that child is functioning right now. And it is really important that family members and outside professionals uh, contribute to that plop. It's not just what's happening um, that the teacher sees, uh, but are there other other I factors that you um, believe are impacting that child's current current functioning, and that should be reflective in in the uh, plop statement. Um, and this is really a great opportunity to enter critical information into the record. That plops is part of the IEP. Um, and so, you know, statements that reflect the extent of the impact of FASD or other conditions um, on their performance. For example, due to limitations in Anita's working memory related to her FASD, Anita's ability to rote recall more than 10 basic multiplication facts is seriously limited. That is a statement of present level of performance. And it notes that there is a, a, a recognized um, a condition of FASD. So it's just one place, even though that eligibility category will not necessarily reflect FASD, that's one place that you can identify that that is a, a factor impacting the present performance. And another really great place to talk about um, uh, the special needs of your child and what may be helpful to them is that goals or objectives section. Um, and even in a 504 plan, there should be some statement of goals or expectations. Um, and again, uh, you want to tie those to the present level of performance. This is where the child is now, and this is the goal that we're going to establish to help them um, improve in that area. Um, you can have goals that relate to that social emotional side that so many of our kids struggle with, social skills, behavior, sustained attention, executive functioning. You can name executive functioning and have goals written around those. Um, you can use a trauma sensitive lens as we think about our goals and objectives. We believe, as you heard, I believe in um, our first webinar about the, the um, similarities, um, the fact that indeed, prenatal exposure to alcohol is a trauma uh, prenatally to the brain. Um, and many of the trauma-sensitive, uh, trauma-informed approaches work very well with our kiddos with FASD. Um, and then again, uh, there's that statement of accommodations and mo modifications. Related to that is a opportunity in an IEP particularly to request um, a functional behavior assessment and develop a behavioral intervention plan. Those are those are terms that are used in the law and regulations. Again, we can help you through that if that's not um, something you're familiar with and maybe you are feeling like you're reaching the end of a rope and an FBA hasn't been done, that may be a very appropriate next step for your child with a disability. Speaking of trauma sensitivity in special education, there are lots of opportunities to really look at the special education standard process of assessing and evaluating of serving the child through um, an IEP in a more trauma sensitive light. And Rossman and Bateman is cited there and there's a wonderful, fairly new document um, applying a trauma informed framework to the IEP process. And that is in the um, reference list. Uh, that might be a very helpful tool for those of you in schools or those of you working to help schools uh, become a little bit more um, in tune with uh, new ways of thinking. Um, other specific interventions for FASD, again, I refer you really very strongly back to, to Dr. Malayan's um, webinar from last week. If you did not catch it, she did an excellent job of talking about evidence-based interventions. Here's just a list. You will see as you look through that list that there is a big focus on that that metacognitive approach of really helping um, kiddos uh, develop strategies. Uh, again, it's brain-based disorder. So, you know, you really um, finding ways to to develop strategies that, that use that strong metacognitive base to um, approach tasks in a different way. Uh, family and school collaboration. Let me take a look at my timing and make sure that, um, oh gosh, okay. So we're really um, closer on time than I thought. Let me just say a few words about this, take a minute and then we'll move to questions. Um, I love this little picture 
of, and I, this was a sculpture uh, that my family saw in a sculpture garden in Pennsylvania. And I love it because I think it really represents when we're thinking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, the, the role of schools and families together. We have to collaborate, to collaborate to keep that watchful eye on that kiddo at all times. Supervision is really, really important. Um, and so this quote, again, from that article, I mentioned earlier, most educators desire to withdraw supervision as children age and demonstrate success, but this may not be a realistic goal for students with FASD. That is really, really key. And I think we heard that in the other webinars that, that we really need to um, up that supervision and not necessarily use the same approaches that we would use with a child of the same chronological age, um, that we know that there is there's good reason to look at that child with a developmental age lens and think about what kind of supervision, what kind of environmental modifications, what kind of supports would a child who's chronologically younger need in those situations. Uh, there are lots of resources that you as parents or caregivers can share with uh, schools or if you're a professional to share with colleagues to help them understand a little bit. These are just some of them and I'm going to tell you how to access those. Um, you are giving a go-to gift. Um, if you are able to identify an appropriate intervention that works for your kid when there's a problem behavior, share that with the teachers and the others that are working with your child. Um, and I promise you resources. <laughs> and Lisa is going to, I believe, um, before the night is out, put all of these links in our chat box. We have a wonderful, very detailed topical webpage. All of the, the resources and references I shared are in that are linked in that um, in that topical webpage about FASD and neurodevelopmental disorders. We also have a topical webpage on trauma. And again, many of the practices in trauma-informed care are very suitable for kiddos with FASD. And then um, transitions to the po those post-school settings, I know is a real challenge for our, our uh, families struggling with FASD. Um, and so there's a tropical, uh, tropical, <laughs> a topical webpage on, uh, on post-secondary transitions as well. There's a lot of special education resources. Again, this is all in your web, um, in your web portal there with the uh, handouts. And um, I'm going to let Lisa share some questions. We are going to share a post-test. I know we're cramming a lot in an hour, but we are trying to do that pre-test, post-test to, to demonstrate whether there's um, some, some hopefully learning that happened during your time with us uh, that helps us do better in our future planning. Lisa, okay. what do you got for me? I have uh, a question that uh, focuses on related services list. Uh, the person asking the question would like to know, is that list from the federal regs for IDEA or is that specific to the Virginia regs? Uh, they should regulation. be, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. That, I believe I took that from the federal regs, but this, the, the Virginia regs have to um, mirror that minimally. They can go beyond the federal regulations, uh, but they have to include those things. So those terms should be in the regulations for Virginia, uh, definitely. So uh, again, it may not be offered to you, <laughs> kind of pres often present a menu to you, but know that those are definitely options uh, for the team to discuss. Okay. Someone is asking if you can clarify if the table one list, the list of neurobehavioral challenges relate to the actual deficits from brain damage associated with fetal alcohol exposure. Oh gosh, so let me see. Um, table, oh, here, the neurobehavioral yes. challenges? Okay, um, so, uh, um, tell me the question again, I'm sorry. They are asking if you can clarify, clarify if the table one list lists the list of neurobehavioral challenges relate to the actual deficits from brain damage associated with fetal alcohol exposure. Um, I would say yes. I don't know. I'll have to look back and see how that author positioned this particular table, but I would say that there's nothing on that list uh, I would say there's nothing on that list that would not have be potentially be associated with brain damage. 
related to the prenatal alcohol exposure. Anxiety might be the exception there, but um, um, I, I, so I think yes. <laughs> and that, that article is included. We have that on our website um, in full, full PDF um, text. So you are welcome to take a look at, at how she identified that, that author identified those. I hope that answered the question. And then the final question that I have right now, um, it's more of a statement. Uh, they are sharing um, that they have a real concern. Their child has to take the SOLs in high school in order to graduate, and the child has never been able to pass the SOLs, and the parent or caregiver has tried to advocate for them to not have to take the SOLs, um, any help would be appreciated. And that sounds like it's someone who's looking for assistance. Um, we would be happy to talk to them in a consultation. Um, so if you would like to reach out to us um, through our contact information, we will be happy to have a conversation with you about that concern. Yeah, there are, and there are some um, ways to do a locally verified credit. Um, but if you want your child to have a standard diploma in Virginia, um, or advanced studies diploma, they must pass at least five SOLs. Um, there is a there is an option um, of a certificate that's not a diploma, um, but if that is your goal, we can talk through different ways to try to get at that, um, to meet those expectations. If they have an IEP, um, there are some options for verified credits that don't require that 400 score. But yes, do what Lisa says, and we can definitely set up a consultation. And I don't have any additional questions. Lisa, are you able to put that post test in the chat did, or did you? I am in the process of doing that. I'm just making sure that we do not have any additional questions. And the previous post that I put into the chat, it multiplied um, when I pasted. So you will have several of the same links. I apologize for that. But now here is the post test. And we do appreciate everyone's patience with us. We are um, federally funded and we really, to be able to offer these things free of charge and bring all, all of those wonderful presenters uh, uh, in the first three webinars, it's really important for us to just have some data about what we're doing. I'm sure you all understand. And we also will have, in addition to the post test and evaluation of the, the webinar. Um, so we're making you, making you work, but they are very short and very quick to complete. Um, I am so thrilled that y'all stuck with us through the end of this. <laughs> I, it was a lot of information. And again, all of that is in that web, uh, that, excuse me, handouts pod. And we are always happy to meet with folks. Um, I know this is a hard road to uh, walk and schools um, are learning. We're all learning um, together, but um, sometimes families really are the first teachers um, of teachers. Uh, so definitely check out that, that, uh, web page with lots of resources that could be shared with with those who care about your child and in the, the services they receive. Lisa, anything else? No, I don't see any additional questions. And Are when you you're ready, to... I have the evaluation form ready yeah, to let's post. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Folks can. Oh, okay and do, do both of those things. Again, very right. quick. <laughs> I see, I see some of our attendees, uh, I know firsthand walk this walk. And so they are, we have experts in our midst. So thank you for joining us. Um, uh, it is, it is uh, um, an on, it's a long road and we really appreciate you being in community with us.
So once you've completed that evaluation and you've completed the post test, um, we'll say good night to you. We're going to leave this up just for a minute more so everybody can grab those links. So we will we'll stay on, uh, but uh, you're free to go and enjoy your evening and prepare for the big snow <laughs> or not. I'll leave this up for one more minute if you want to grab those links out of the chat box before you go. If you haven't had a chance to get to both of the evaluation and the post test, please do that. And just to let those who are still with us know, uh, the evaluation link will also be included in a follow-up email that you will receive um, within the next 24 to 48 hours. So no pressure to get to that, but we would like to have it as soon as possible. All right, Lisa, I'm going to say good night and say good night to everyone. Thank you again for joining us. We are here to help at any point along your journey. Um, be safe, be well, and thanks again. Good night, everyone.